Hi, I'm Ben, and I like plants, mushrooms, fluffy dogs, and stuff like that. It's getting into late summer, and things are looking pretty green and leafy out there. Let's go see what we can find. The first thing that we're going to look at is a rough little mushroom. This one is the poison pigskin puffball, or the earthball, Scleroderma citrinum. It's one of the poisonous puffballs, and easily identified by the rough, scaly texture of the outer skin, also known as the peridium. You'd probably recognize these as the mushrooms that do this. I've heard that the earth ball has adapted to release its spores when rain falls. As each drop hits the mushroom, the peridium bounces a little bit, and spores are shot into the air, ready to be dispersed by the wind. I could see how that makes sense. Or, then again, maybe they evolved so you could do this. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> Try not to breathe in the spores, since they can cause something called lycopridinosis. Basically, the spores get caught in your lungs and give you a really, really bad time. You'd have to get a good lung full of spores to get sick, so I wouldn't worry too much about stepping on them or giving them a good poke for fun. That probably won't hurt you. If you get them in your eyes, you can get conjunctivitis, or some nice red irritated eyes. So, yeah, don't do that. On this one, you can sort of see the gleba, which is the spongy, spore-bearing mass on the inside of the mushroom. The gleba in puffballs is especially springy to help the mushrooms puff and spread their spores. In more immature mushrooms, the gleba is still firm. As the mushroom develops, it changes from white to black. This is an excellent way of distinguishing these poisonous earth balls from other edible mushrooms, like the gem-studded puffball, which should have a nice white interior. This one I found is just starting to get dark in the middle, not quite ready for puffing yet. A little side note, remember how Amanita rubicins can be parasitized by Hypomyces hyalinus? Well, here's a cool thing that happens to earth balls that are in the right place at the wrong time. This is Pseudobolitis parasiticus, a parasitic mushroom that can only be found growing on earth balls. This one doesn't as much cover up the existing mushroom, but grows straight out of it. As far as I know, it's the only bolete parasite on Scleroderma citrinum, which makes it pretty easy to identify. Other key features are the dark streaks on the stipe and the typical bolete spongy pores. The inside of the parasitized earth ball is not the typical dark color, but it's a bit paler and grayish, which is the result of being robbed by the parasitic bolete. So yeah, neat little mushroom on a mushroom. Just to recap, that's the poison pigskin puffball, or the earth ball, and they're not edible, and consumption will definitely lead to gastrointestinal distress, which is probably the most common side effect of eating random crap that you find on the forest floor. Here's some random crap from the forest floor that you can eat. Touch-me-nots, also known as jewelweed, are a nifty plant to know about. They're easily identified by flowers that are mottled orange, yellow, or sometimes even pink. This is the first clump of pink jewelweed I've ever found, so I'm pretty pumped by it. You could say that I'm tickled pink. Okay, so the stems and leaves are succulent, soft, and really high in water. The crushed plant can be used as a treatment for the usual forest itches, like bug bites, poison ivy, and stinging nettles. The seeds, which are really fun to disperse but annoying to collect, taste weirdly similar to walnuts. They're fiddly little things, so I wouldn't recommend collecting the seeds if you actually need food. It's pretty hard to hold on to them because of their dispersal mechanism. This dispersal mechanism is known as explosive dehiscence and it stores the mechanical energy into specialized tissues surrounding the seeds. When the seeds are ripe, they're prone to triggering at the slightest touch, so gathering seeds trying to launch themselves as far as botanically possible isn't really the best idea. The leaves are reportedly edible after boiling in a change of water, and they also won't explode while you're trying to collect them, so I'll have to give that a try. This particular jewelweed is Impatiens capensis, the spotted jewelweed. Impatience is a genus that encompasses over a thousand species of flowering plants, including many in the tropics. 
If you've done any gardening or planted some tender annuals for your grandma, then you might recognize the little multicolored bedding plants that are a related species. You can also pop their little seed pods in the same way, so have fun. Hey, this is almost a fairy ring. Or, it sort of is. These slimy bad boys are a mycorrhizal mushroom commonly found associating with larch trees. This has given them the exceedingly uncreative yet fitting common name, the larch bolete. I really like mycorrhizal mushrooms. They just fit into such a cool place in the environment, getting help from trees and giving help in return. Such good boys. The slimy cap is one of the key identifying characteristics of this mushroom. If it's still dewy, the mushrooms are probably going to look pretty slick and spoogy but they can dry out. They range from orangey to rust brown in color. Pretty, but kind of gross at the same time. Looking underneath the mushroom, you can see the remnants of the veil. The pores are yellow and bruised to brown if you smush them a little bit. The pores seem to sort of run down the stem a little bit which forms this webby pattern that I find pretty interesting. They are edible, as are most of the Suillus genus, but are exceptionally mediocre, so much so that it's often advised not to waste your time with them. The thick, gloopy cuticle on top of the cap can cause gastrointestinal distress, so it should be removed prior to cooking. Drying the mushrooms after removing the cuticle offers another layer of flavor which is often recommended, or at least if you're going to go through the effort of eating them. Larch boletes seem pretty susceptible to slugs and bugs around here, or at least compared to the other mushrooms out now. The best thing to do would be to take the youngest ones, since the old ones are pretty dang nasty. It's a shame they taste so mediocre, since they're growing all over the place right now. Oh well, on to the next thing. Look at him go. He's fast. He is speed. He is a hickory tussock moth larva. This black and white caterpillar is the juvenile life stage of the hickory tussock moth. They feed on most of the hardwood tree leaves around here, mainly hickory, but also maples, ash, oak, and a whole slew of other things. I think they're pretty cute, with their fluffy white coats and marbly black patches. The four black pointy points on the front and the rear are called the hair pencils, a feature that's shared among other related species. The hickory tussock moth larvae are not terribly destructive to trees they feed on. When young, the clusters of larvae can cause some local defoliation, but usually nothing too damaging to the tree. They become much more isolated as they mature, doing minimal damage to their host plants. These ones are just hanging out on a blueberry bush, chomping away. I don't think that they're going to hurt anything this late in the year. In fact, these big boys are nearly ready to curl up and go to sleep for the winter. I kind of accidentally found this nearby while scoping out some mushrooms. It also just so happens to be the cocoon of the banded tussock moth. So these little chubs should definitely be ready to curl up and pupate. They weave together a nice little fuzzy shell around themselves, laced with larval hairs. Inside, there should be a caterpillar pupating in a little brown thing that looks a lot like Kakuna from Pokemon. I'm not breaking this little fluff open to look, because that's mean, so just imagine a Pokemon inside a Snuggie, and you get the picture. Good night, little guy. There are some other tussock moths in the area as well. This one is a banded tussock moth. These larvae look pretty similar, but are a bit more yellow. They also have the same long black hair pencils. They function pretty much the same too, eating leaves of loads of different broadleaf plants. Something I didn't mention with the hickory tussocks was that most members of this family share the ability to accumulate toxic alkaloids from their host plants. These alkaloids build up to the point that the bugs are no longer palatable, or are even toxic to predators. Even better than that, their spiny bristles can cause rashes and allergic reactions when in contact with soft skin. So no cuddles for the soft little caterpillars, even if they look so frickin' cute. Wouldn't you cuddle that? Ah, whatever. I guess that's it for today. Any day you find some mushrooms and look at a plant is a good day, or at least to me it is. Alright, see you later. Here, have a squirrel. <laughs>